way home last Sunday morning, after having made a few comments about gay marriage and you reacting the way you did, B said, the only thing I regret, Reg, was that you didn't give scripture for what you were saying because people can always argue if there's not scripture. And she had a wonderful point. It wasn't even a part of my message, it just came out that way. So I asked the Lord permission today to preach a message to you that's a standalone message along these lines because I want to make sure that we as a church are on the same page and we understand why we take the position we do. We don't want to be rude. We don't want to be ugly. We don't want to be bigots. We just want to stand with the Word of God. Can you say amen? Praise God. So, so today, I, I guess I just want to talk about this, this um, issue of tolerance that we hear so much about in society. We are a society of tolerance. Anything goes. And we as Christian must, Christians must find out where we stand because in the days ahead we will be mocked as we already are for things we believe and stand for and we have to understand that that's okay. They persecuted Jesus. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Can you say amen? This week I did receive some reaction mail. And I thought I would have Brother Larry come and read one of the letters that I received. So before you start shouting, listen to all of it. It'll be interesting to hear this letter. Please convey my regards to your entire pastoral team for this past Sunday's worship service. I am new to the Lakeland area and attended services at your beautiful church. For the first time this past Sunday, I could not get over how truly professional and organized everything appeared to be. Something truly touched a chord deep within my soul that morning. For halfway through the musical portion of the service, I began to feel unexpected tears well up. This is a rare occurrence for me, and I immediately felt at home and ease, which, if you knew me personally, you would know that this is no small task. When Pastor Reggie took the stage, it was more of the same. I felt transfixed as if somehow that sermon was tailor-made just for me. Again, even though the service was by no means over, I felt as though I'd come home. I found Pastor Reggie to be warm, welcoming, and entertaining as he regaled the congregation with tales from his earlier days as a pastor and of marriage issues, long since lovingly resolved to illustrate his text from the gospel, beautiful, until with a twinkle in his eye and with a lift of his charismatic voice, he teased the congregation by mentioning gay and lesbian and transgender people in marriage. He deliberately baited them into egging him on, and when he finally delivered on their request for more, the congregation erupted into a near deafening applause and shouts of amen. I felt immediately saddened and let down. Gone was the warmth and joy in my heart. I have not seen that manner of speech and response since Adolf Hitler delivered his speeches persecuting Jews, gypsies, trade unionists, and non-Aryans in general. It was truly a disconcerting experience and completely unsouthern to boot. I've spent over 20 years in the South now, and I have a pretty respectable handle on Southern hospitality. One doesn't invite people into their home and then make them feel uncomfortable in any way. It simply isn't genteel in any way, shape, or form, and is, in fact, considered to be rude behavior. When one is a pastor of a church, God's house, that pastor is, in fact, its steward, and simply does not go out of their way to make anyone uncomfortable. That is neither Christian, nor is it Southern behavior. Now, I'm certain that at this point you're thinking, well, this is purely the rant of someone who is part of the homosexual agenda. Well, sir, you would be half right. I am homosexual and proudly so, but beyond that and living a good, simple life, I have no agenda. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not all that big on gay marriage. Let's face it, with the divorce rate hovering at a lofty 47% in this country, with people leaving their spouses at the first sign of trouble, with people saying, Lord, take one of us now and let it not be the person who serves you the most, it doesn't seem that the heterosexual agenda has very much to crow about regarding marriage and family values. It is very troubling indeed that in this day and age, people still need to galvanize hate and derision for others, 
simply to feel good about themselves. An interesting addendum to all of this is that 50 to 60 years ago, a church like yours would have preached the very same things regarding African Americans and people of Hispanic descent, who are all welcomed in your house of worship today. That at least is a wonderful thing. As I left your beautiful facility, I found myself praying for your pastoral team and, in fact, your congregation. I prayed for compassion for all of you. I prayed for peace. I prayed for tolerance. And most of all, I prayed that God's infinite love would fill and help to heal your hearts so that someday, hopefully not too far into the future, you can truly accept all of God's children. Needless to say, I will not be attending any more services at your church. News which I'm sure gladdens your hearts, since I am, after all, a homosexual. In the spirit of God's light, respectfully. You and I are facing uncertain times. We face a lot of challenges. One of those are these agendas that are being forced upon the Christian world. Not only the world, but the Christian world. We have in this very church people who take issue with my stand along those lines. It's hard to believe that, but we do. And so I think it's important to realize that the very thing I was teaching last Sunday morning out of Mark 4 is exactly what happened to this person. They're probably a very nice person. People that I've known in the, in the homosexual community, some of them are some of the nicest people you ever meet. We have such a situation in our own family where somebody has that orientation. And they're one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. But you don't go to heaven because you're nice. Amen. You go to heaven because you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're obedient to the Word of God. Can you say amen? So notice this again from Mark 4, because Satan does come immediately to steal away. You see, this person felt the presence of God. They said it's very unusual for them, however they said it, to be in tears and so forth. God was touching their hearts. That's the beauty of bringing people into the house of the Lord. There's an atmosphere in the house of the Lord that'll touch people's hearts. If you'll just trust God when they come in, not everybody's going to receive it. Satan does come immediately to try to steal the word. Let's just see this right again now. Let's begin at Mark 4. Today I'm going to be using all of my scriptures from the New King James Version. I think it just really is great for this topic especially. It says this in Mark 4 beginning at verse 1. Again Jesus began to teach by the sea and a great multitude was gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat on it on the sea and the whole multitude was facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, listen, behold a sower went out to sow and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Verse 9 says, and he said unto them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. How many of you know when you come to the house of God, you have to put on ears to hear? You've got to put aside your own beliefs. You've got to put aside, now listen, let me, let me just say this right up front. If I don't give you chapter verse for what I'm teaching and preaching, you have no responsibility. But when I give you in context what God's Word says, not isolated scriptures that just justify what I'm wanting to say, but when I give you con in context scriptures, it's your responsibility to take it to heart and you adapt to the Word of God and don't expect the Word of God to adapt to you. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Verses 13 through 15, or verse 10, he says, But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. Then 13 through 15 said, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So before we talk further about what our posture should be along these types of issues, let's see clearly what does the Word have to say about homosexuality. How many of you will listen with your ears? That's all I ask of you. Just hear the Word of God. Notice starting in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22. 
It says this, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Abomination means a detestable thing. Then Leviticus 20 verse 13 says this, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now along with this were other sexual sins that were mentioned in the law that brought the same penalty. I want you to know that. I'm not isolating just one thing, but in this topic alone, I think Christians understand adultery is wrong. I think they understand fornication fornication is wrong. I think they understand that lying and cheating and stealing is wrong. We seem to have that, but there has been such a job done on the church from the outside to condition us to accept something that God's Word forbids and calls, causes it or calls it an abomination. Now, if this were just in the Old Covenant, you could say, well, that's Old Testament law. So let's just set that there as your thoughts. And now let's go over to the New Testament and see what it has to say on the same subject. Can you say amen? amen. I wrote this, since we are not living in Old Testament times and we the church do not put people to death as they did then, and since we today's church are to get our lifestyle from the New Testament, then what does the New Testament actually have to say on the subject? Go with me first to Romans chapter 1. Say out loud, Romans. Romans. Say, thank God for Romans. Romans. Now notice, begin at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts, animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. You know, the Word of God in talking about sexual sins said all other sins are outside the body. But sexual sins are a sin against the body. That's why you see so many diseases rampant where loose living is so evident. Can you say amen? Now notice, notice it goes on to say in verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice, I want everybody to say practice. Those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. We have to be careful as Christians what we approve of. We must be careful what we accept, what we approve of. Because if we approve of what God forbids and we laugh about it and we joke about it and we make it light, we lessen its, we lessen its potency. Can you say amen? So I have to talk about this. And then I want to raise the issue of practice. Because there may be people in this room that have a tendency, a temptation, a challenge towards homosexuality. But you live a free, clean life in Jesus Christ. I want to establish today there is a difference between temptation and practice. 
Practice is a lifestyle. It's something you do. It's something you have given in yourself into. It's something you continue operating in. You practice it. But if you have a challenge in your life somewhere and you do not practice it simply because God word, God's Word forbids it, then I want you to know God's Word will back you up and change will happen in your life because you have agreed with the Word of God. I believe that with every fiber of my being. I believe that. One of the most liberating things that ever happened in my life was when I understood for the first time in my life, years ago now, that temptation was not a sin. Amen. You might be tempted towards somebody at work. You may be working with somebody, all of a sudden they've become attractive to you. And you may have a temptation, a thought about that come in your mind. Well, the temptation is not sinful. You may, you may be tempted for, towards fornication. You may be unmarried, a man and a woman, and you, 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 you are attracted to each other. And the next thing you know, you start dating and you give in to what the Bible calls fornication. You need to get yourself straight with God, separate from that situation until God works within your lives and live a clean and a pure life. It is not God's will. That's why sometimes people come to us. They're living together and they're wanting to go on as if there's nothing wrong in their, in their life. And we have to confront them with this issue and say, listen, God's word does not allow fornication in your life. And so folks, listen, all of us are tempted in some area. How many have a temptation once in a while? Sure you do. You're a human being. Temptation is not sin. As a matter of fact, let me take you to, to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, and read you something because it's very important. It says this, talking about Jesus. It says this in 4.14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. This clearly makes it so that temptation or something you feel a weakness about does not mean you've sinned. You, it means that you're going to hold on to God and let him give you power over what the temptation is, no matter what it is. You might be a college student in here today or a high school student in here today, and you're saying to yourself, I, I have a temptation to cheat. Looking around under somebody else's paper on a test. The temptation is not a sin, but you better not let your eyes wander too far to where you use their answer for your answer. Well, he's a straight A student. I'm a C student. I know his answer is going to be better than mine. I'm going to see what he said, and I'm going to put it on mine. Or telling a lie. B, when she was growing up, she used to tell me this. There were a couple times somebody called about their bill not being paid. And B's stepmother would tell her, tell them I'm not home. I'm really getting strong today. I can tell that it's gotten really quiet in this room. Just tell them I'm not home. Not only did you just lie to the bill collector, you taught your child that lying is okay. Don't clap me down now because I'm preaching real good. <laughs> Jesus was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Now notice this. How do I deal with these temptations? Let us therefore come boldly. Boldly. Jesus was tempted. He understands temptation. He walked the earth. He dealt with temptation so that he could take care of it for you and me. So let us come boldly before the throne of grace. Hallelujah. Cry out grace today. Grace. To help in time of need. No, thank God temptation is not sin. So practicing is one thing. Being tempted is another, and what we're talking about is justifying the practice of sin.
whether it be adultery, fornication, homosexuality, whatever it is, we're dealing with sin. Some of you may ask the question, well, what about grace? There's a tremendous amount of teaching going on today on the subject of grace. You can actually split churches on the subject of grace. But let me just give you what Paul said here in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? When you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death. You have died to sin and you've come alive in Jesus. Can you say amen? That doesn't mean you never miss it, for we do miss it. But thank God we have a perpetual cleansing of the blood of Jesus. If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father through Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Thank God we have an advocate. When we miss it, we can run to him and we don't have to run from him. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. But grace wasn't given us to overrun the Word of God and to live any way we want to. Actually, grace was given to us to empower us over temptation, over the works of the devil, over anything the enemy may throw at you. You just sometimes need to look in the face of temptation and say, grace, come to me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Further on the subject of sin, in the New Testament, we also have these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that means practicing that, nor idolaters, you know, we don't think about idolatry, but anything you put over God is idolatry. Amen. All alone am I. I'm right up here by myself today. I'll just pretend I'm on TV and I don't get any response from the audience. Do not be deceived. See, we can be deceived. This man, as well as his intents might have been, I'm throwing no stones at him, wrote a very nice letter. Other than that off Hitler thing, I'll take it. <laughs> but somehow, he was experiencing what Mark 4 says. He was in God's presence. He was weeping in God's presence. But the minute I touched something that he disagreed with, he rejected that presence for that sin. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That means those who practice that does not mean those who are tempted with any of this. It means those who practice this. I want you to look at somebody and say there's a major difference between being tempted and practicing. Do you all receive that? That's very important. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you as a young person, 17, 18, 19 years of age, you know, your hormones are coming alive back then. How many of you remember that, those days? <laughs> I still remember them. And I felt condemned for what I was tempted to do. I felt this, I actually heard this. If you were a real Christian, you wouldn't want to do that. I remember one time, 17 years of age, 
I had come out of a red hot Pentecostal service where missions were an emphasis. And I remember how my heart was really touched that night. And I'd come home and gone to bed. All of a sudden, you can believe this or not, I'm telling you this before the living God. I felt this awful presence in my room. I was actually, if you face the foot of my bed, I was on the right-hand side, but it would be on my left right here. Standing right there beside me, as visible as any one of you right now, was the devil himself. There's no doubt in my mind he was trying to enter me and cause me to go in a direction that was not the plan or the purpose of God. And it scared me so much, I didn't know what to do. All I did was kick my feet and said, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And I ran out the door. I'll never forget, it was that real to me. You can believe it or not, it's okay with me. Supernatural things are real. Satan appeared to Jesus. He came right to him and talked to him. How dumb can you get than to go to the Son of God thinking he might just listen to you? But what was he met with? Satan, it is written. The temptations were real, but Jesus countered the temptations with the Word of God. That's why you've got to hide God's Word in your heart that you will not sin against Him. Can you say amen? Now, I love verse 11. Notice this. And such were some of you. All these things, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revelers, extortioners, such were some of you, but they're not anymore. What happened? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Lift your hands and thank Him that He's talking about you there. Hallelujah. Somewhere you can find yourself. Something changed. That's what that means. They received grace to change. Grace is the ability of God beyond what you deserve, beyond what you've merited, beyond what you could earn on your own. By grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. God graces you for whatever He calls you to do. If He tells you not to do something, He graces you not to do that. If He calls you to do something, He graces you to do what He's called you to do. That's why we cry grace. If it's against us, we need His help. If it's for Him, we need His help. God will never call you to do something He doesn't furnish the ability for you to do. Hallelujah. If He calls you, rejoice in the fact His grace is going to be sufficient for you to carry it out. So don't let the devil beat you up. Kick you around cause you to feel condemned about what you struggle with. I feel rather than this being a condemning message, it's a liberating message. It brings you freedom not to be kicked around by the devil because you may want to do something, but you're trusting God's grace that you don't. And seeing it for what it is and not succumbing to the temptations and the deception that's all around you. One of the things that always really, really bothers me, and I don't even know how to say this, I'm, I really don't, but it really, really bothers me that they pull the race card in this topic. Let me tell you something. If I were in Africa, I would be a minority. If I were in South America, I would be a minority being a white person. So we have in America minorities that are from the black community, the Hispanic community, the Asian community, or whatever. That has nothing to do with anything. We accept each other. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses all. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We have no divisions among us. There should be no color about us. We don't see white, black, red, or brown. We don't see it. If we're truly washed in the blood, we are brothers and sisters in Christ.
When Family Worship Center began, the statement I made is whatever percentage of any minority that's in this community, I want them to be at Family Worship Center because I want this to be a multicultural church. I have a heart for that. That is my heart. And that is the heart of this church. Matter of fact, back when I took a few positions during the elections, and I typically don't do that, but over these very issues, I was disturbed. And B came home, she was fighting mad. I don't know when I've seen her that mad. She said, Reggie, it just upsets me that anybody could throw racism at you. If there's any human being I know in this world that's not racist, it's you. She was really upset about it because the truth is that is not my heart nor the heart of this church. But don't go compare that to homosexuality. It's not a sin to be black or white or Asian. It's a sin to practice homosexuality. Amen. Amen. So when temptation comes, don't feel condemned about it. Call on the grace of God. The Apostle Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God of God. He had many things happen to him, but he stood and walked steady with God. He bowed his knee to the Father of spirits, of just men made perfect. He wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit words that we teach and preach today. He was empowered by the Spirit. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Use God's grace not to sin, but to live free from sin. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Shout out loud and say thank God for the word. Now notice these two principles in James 4, 7. How do I get there? Number one, submit yourself to God. If you're a homosexual or you have temptations towards this, come just like you are to the throne. Say, Jesus, this is going on in my life. This is what I'm dealing with. This is what I have not been able to overcome. I tell you what, when I grew up, you almost had to have already become to be accepted. But no, we need to accept people in whatever state they come. Come just like you are. Come just like you are. Come just like you are, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Jesus, I come. Submit to God, number one. And number two, resist the devil. Push back. Resist him. And the Bible says he will flee from you. And one translation says he will run from you as in terror. Listen, instead of you being afraid of the devil, make the devil afraid of you. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, please hear this. Just because society is warm to the idea of gay marriage and homosexual lifestyle and states have okayed it, we as the church must not succumb to their way of thinking. Can you say amen? This is important for many reasons. We have young people in here today who are dealing with this in school. Some of their friends have this orientation. They don't want to be condemning. They want to be kind. They want to be accepting. But you can love the person yet hate the sin. And that's exactly, you know, we have parents that have gotten upset at me over the years because of touching this very subject because their children deal with that, one of their children or two of their children or whatever the case might be, deal with that in their own lives. But if you love your son. If you love your daughter, continue to love them and surround them with faith, but don't accept their sin. That is going to destroy them and damn them to a devil's hell if they continue to practice that lifestyle. That gets real quiet because of the grace issue. Grace was not given us to sin. It was given to us to be empowered not to sin. Please get that straight. Now I'm gonna give you a scripture here that justifies the fact that we aren't to go around condemning being ugly to people. 
But notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love. That's what we're called to do. I trust it's what I'm doing today. May grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Again, the argument that's being set forth of using minorities as a tool is coming from the trickery of men and cunning devices. And don't you, as the church of Jesus Christ, buy the lie. Don't you buy the lie. Stand fast, stand strong, believe the Word of God. Try to get your friends to commit themselves, to submit themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and tell them God will help you. He will change you. Hallelujah. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new and all things are of God. Can you say amen? And then finally, finally, I want you to hear this. And this is why alone, not often, but alone, I have to preach these truths. We have ministers on the TV. When asked the question about these issues, dodge them. But I have news for you. If they didn't dodge them, they know it's the last time they'd be on that program. I don't want to be on their programs. I'm not going to compromise to be on somebody's program. How about you? Now listen to Paul's instructions, and I'm going to end with this, because this is what I must do as a preacher, whether you agree with me or disagree with me. That's between you and the Lord. But listen to my charge. 2 Timothy 4, beginning at verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season. In other words, when it's popular. And out of season, when it's not popular. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now listen, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Fables sound good, but they're not true. I want to build my life on what is true. Would you stand up and lift up your hands towards heaven today and give him praise in his house?